Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 2. 1918. Chapter 10. The Cat and the Mice. After about a week in Petrograd, my wife and I went to Moscow. The city of Peter the Great was dying, and with it was passing an epoch of Russian history, the period which during two centuries transformed Muscovia into the Russian Empire, created a true Russian culture, and achieved greatly in art, literature, and science. Now it was all passing. Thousands of Petrograd families, menaced with starvation and in deadly fear of the German invasion, which was rapidly nearing the capital, were fleeing the town. Even the Bolshevist government was moving to Moscow. Settling my affairs as well as I could, and securing from the government a positive pledge that my companions and Peter and Paul would be released, my wife and I, after incredible difficulties, secured tickets and places in the Moscow Express. With deep sadness we left Petrograd, for behind us lay all our past, and before us lay we knew not what. In the filthy and overcrowded car, emaciated faces, suffering bodies, criminal countenances of Bolshevist agents, and all the vileness of the unrestrained mob surrounded us. We pressed our faces to the unwashed windows. Farewell, beloved city. Farewell, the monument of Peter the Great, still left standing in the Admiralty Gardens, to give us hope that neither Russia nor the Russian people are utterly doomed. Now forward. Our hopes were still alive, our courage strong. Was it not said? The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. And did not the founder of Petrograd say? Know that the life of Peter is nothing to him. What is everything is that Russia may live and prosper. In this frame of mind we patiently endured the 37-hour journey to Moscow, a matter of 14 hours in normal times. Moscow. What the name means to a Russian heart. What emotions it awakens in the Russian soul. Yet now, if Petrograd impresses one as a dying capital, Moscow reminds him of a disturbed antelope. Throngs of refugees pouring into the town, Bolshevist officials trying to force communist doctrines on people who abhor them, peasants illegally bringing in and selling food and bread, and thereby saving the population from starvation, wrangling politicians and intellectuals, all these, together with the excited masses, give the impression of a furiously boiling pot. Many houses have been burned, many more damaged, many walls marked with bullets and bombs. Some streets, as Prechistenka and Nikitskia, are completely wrecked. Upon my arrival, I called on a friend, formerly a rich merchant, and found him now, nationalized, all his property, even to his furniture and household treasures, requisitioned. The bare walls of his house had been left him, and he had been ordered to leave the house within three days' time. I asked him what he intended to do. What can I do? He asked patiently. With my sick wife I am going temporarily to the home of a friend who has offered us a room I am not so unhappy as you might think. Now I have no business for them to interfere with. As a free proletarian I can go about, look, and observe. The thing I most regret is that my wealth has gone, not for the common good but for the enrichment of scoundrels. Next day I met other friends, scientists, scholars, and politicians, many workmen and peasants. The infamous Treaty of Brest-Litovsk leaving Russia in the hands of ruthless Germany, destroying the country both financially and morally, aroused in all classes the utmost rage and indignation. To Moscow flocked thousands determined to arrive at some constructive plan for saving the name of Russia from shame and dishonor. Something had to be done to stay the hand of destruction, and quickly, for the morale of the populace was beginning to break down. Crazed with hunger, peasants and workers had already begun to strike, riot, and plunder. The Bolsheviki did nothing to restore peace. On the contrary, after having broken up the Constitutional Assembly, they began to break up all newly elected Soviets which in any degree resisted their tyranny. The despotic nature of their policy became daily more apparent. While the autocratically appointed, not elected, All-Russian Conference of the Soviets held their meeting in Moscow, a meeting in which the American Red Cross Colonel, Raymond Robbins, actively participated, while they were welcoming the power of the peasants and workers, we renewed our activities. 
we knew that the country was too exhausted, too demoralized to fight victoriously, still we hoped that there was in the social and individual life of the nation material for regeneration. We therefore organized the nucleus of a League for the Regeneration of Russia, recruited from liberal parties, beginning with socialists and ending with the more radical members of the Constitutional Democratic Party. We sought first to learn the actual state of mind of people in all parts of Russia, and next to form plans for military defense of the country against further German invasion. All our meetings and conferences had to be held secretly, and old methods of procedure which we had thought to abandon forever when the Tsar was overthrown were revived. Good habits always come in handy, said Arganov, whose long experience in revolutionary practices made him something of a leader in this respect, even among revolutionists as experienced as himself. My personal connection with this new society was curtailed by ill health, caused by nervous strain, intensive scientific work just before the revolution, by subsequent confinement, and finally by starvation. Rest and good food were ordered, and to get both I decided to spend three or four weeks in one of the Volga towns. One evening in March my wife and I went to the Pavlitsky station, railway tickets in our pockets, hoping to find places in the train. Tickets in our communist country were not easy to procure, but after two days of hard work and persuasion we got them. At the station nobody could tell us when the train would start, but a huge crowd was waiting to rush it as soon as it arrived. After seven hours it rolled into the station, and then ensued a spectacle quite indescribable. The whole enormous crowd rushed madly forward, jamming, pressing, fighting, shrieking, climbing one man on top of another, and finally seizing places, in the train, on top of the wagons, on the platforms between wagons, and even on the brake beams underneath. As for my wife and me, we got no places at all, but were obliged to go back to our lodgings. The next day we tried again, and I think we never should have left Moscow but for the resourcefulness of an experienced friend. I'll settle it. He said, and settle it he certainly did, for the next day, before the train had even backed into the station, we found ourselves comfortably installed in a sleeping wagon. We asked him how he achieved such a miracle, and he replied. Why, you unsophisticated man, I simply turned a key which in our communist paradise unlocks all doors. I bribed a commissary. We felt that this method of getting an advantage over ordinary travelers was unethical, but we were so tired, and the compartment was so warm and comfortable that we had not courage to give up our places. We protested, but rather feebly. Don't be foolish. Said our practical friend. To live with wolves one must learn to howl like wolves. Did all these people who have places get them this way? I asked. Of course. How else? When the train backed into the station, we watched from our window the same shocking scene of crazed people fighting their way into the train, climbing roofs of carriages and clinging to brake beams. The cries of the injured and trampled were horrid, the yells of the stronger and more brutal frightful to hear. Half an hour after starting, the train stopped with a sudden jar which threw off two passengers clinging to platform rails. Their mutilated bodies were picked up and thrown carelessly into a luggage van, after which the journey was resumed. Several times the same thing happened, the vacant places of the victims being instantly occupied by persons having even less comfortable positions. At every station was repeated the wild scenes of pushing, fighting, and beating away into the packed and stifling train. In vain, station guards and soldiers with rifles tried to hold the crowd back. At one place the soldiers actually fired on the people. At last, through these torments, we reached Kozlov. Up to this time it had been impossible to buy any food, but here we found bread, real bread, with plenty of milk and meat. Passengers risking the loss of their places in the train made a mad descent upon that food. To understand it one must have known starvation. Like wild animals we fought each other, striking, gouging, kicking, grabbing what we could of that precious bread and meat, afterwards devouring rather than swallowing it. Ah! What joy to hold in your hands bread, real bread. To smell it, bite into it, chew it slowly, revel in every morsel until you feel at last that yawn are no longer hungry. 
Guillaume was right when he said that drinking the milk of Switzerland in mountains sometimes gave one a sense of beauty no less gratifying than the reading of a perfect romance. People who have never suffered hunger perhaps cannot understand this. Next morning we reached the Volga. Here also the revolution had left its bloody finger marks, for in the villages peasant riots waged fiercely. Communist troops taking from the peasants corn, milk, and meat, they had tried to defend their property by force, with the result that many on both sides had been killed and wounded. At the moment of our arrival at this Volga town the communists were gathering large forces to put down the peasants' anarchy. The mind of the towns, especially among workmen, was intensely hostile to the Bolsheviki. A few days after our arrival were held elections to the Soviet of the town and province. The communists received only a small minority of votes, so they descended on the Soviet, dispersed it, arrested all the majority members and appointed communist deputies in their places. The fury of the population was so great at this outrage that a general riot amounting to civil war was momentarily expected. Gathering full particulars of these events and helping to organize forces for future all-Russian movements against communists and Germans, I remained secretly in this town for about four weeks. Having some free time, I resumed my interrupted scientific researches and began the first draft of my system of sociology. Comparatively good food, rest, and a regular habit of life resulted in rapid improvement of health and, recalled by urgent telegrams from Moscow, on May 4 I left my country retreat. If travel from Moscow to the Volga had been unpleasant, the return journey was even worse. The train was full of mesheckniks, bagmen, principally peasants, bringing sackfuls of flour and potatoes to sell in Moscow. This harmless business, persecuted by the communists as counter-revolutionary, was full of danger to all those who carried it on. Trains bore special troops for the purpose of confiscating all foodstuffs and arresting the Mesheckniks. But hope of gain being stronger than fear of punishment, the Meshekniki continued their trade. By bribes to government officials and by all other known expedients they went back and forth, and the food they managed to smuggle into the cities undoubtedly saved thousands from actual starvation. Markets and shops closed and all private trading forbidden, food selling and buying persisted, just as life itself persists. The Bolshevist agents invaded our compartment and arrested one of the Mesheckniks, taking him to a wagon in the rear where other, criminals, and counter-revolutionists, were held. After a short time he returned, and others asked eagerly. What did you pay? And he replied, despair in his voice. All I had. Two pounds. About seventy-two pounds. A flour and ten pounds of butter. Selling, I hope to buy scythes and some nails. Now I have neither scythes, flour nor butter. Never mind, old fellow. Said one of them. You may yet have good luck. Soon two agents of the government came again into our wagon, and the last peasant addressed them. Look here, Tovarishi. Comrade. You took everything this chap had. Don't you think that too much? Silence. Roared the Bolshevist. This is not your affair. Don't shout at me, Tovarishi. I am not a dog. You ought to return this man half at any rate. Take him to the rear wagon. Commanded the agent. But the peasant, smiling and stroking his beard, said pleasantly. Don't be in such a hurry. I don't fear arrest, but if you do arrest me all your bribe-taking, all your profiteering, including those two pounds of flour and ten pounds of butter will be denounced and perhaps we may find ourselves in the same prison. Wouldn't it be better for you to give half the flour and butter back? Well, we'll see about it. Grumbled the agent. And the Mesheknik did get back half his property. Two miles below Moscow all the food traders threw their bags out of the train, themselves jumping after at risk of breaking their necks. Only in this way could they avoid arrest at the station. In Moscow the activity of all the anti-Bolshevist groups continued. The League for the Regeneration of Russia, the League for the Fatherland and the Revolution, this headed by Savinkov, the Social Revolutionary, Social Democratic, and Constitutional Democratic parties, worked zealously together. Plans for a general uprising against the Bolsheviki and the Germans were being matured. 
Among the Bolsheviki themselves there was appearing friction, the left social revolutionaries resenting the abject surrender of the Bolshevist leaders to the Germans. Conflict between the Bolsheviki and the Czechoslovak legionnaires had also arisen. In a word, the Bolshevik leaders found themselves so discredited that they turned for support to their military forces, the Lettish troops, troops made up of German and Austrian war prisoners, Chinese and all kinds of adventurers and criminals. The real Bolshevist reign of terror began at this time and under this tremendous pressure of adverse public opinion. As a result great changes took place within the socialist parties, many of those who formerly held extreme or doctrinaire views becoming much more moderate. Many, quite disgusted with what they had seen of socialism in practice, abjured altogether the theory. Immediately after my return, we began publication of our newspaper, Regeneration, and no sooner had the first copy appeared than Bolshevist agents raided the office, seeking to arrest the editors. They destroyed all copy, broke up forms and matrices, and smashed presses. Nevertheless, we went on writing, and for a month we issued regular editions. The cat and mouse game began all over again, and this time more ferociously. The resourcefulness of the mice included an elaborate system of danger signals, placed in all houses and apartments frequented by the editorial force. Special means of egress were provided in all buildings, and many were the hairbreadth escapes we made. I have no space here to describe them, but they were ingenious, picturesque, and sometimes positively perilous. In Moscow at this time I met Kerensky, whom I had not seen before since the Bolshevist Revolution. Entering his apartment, I was met by a long-haired, bearded man wearing thick blue spectacles, the general makeup recalling the intellectuals of the 1860-70 period. In his six months of hiding, Kerensky had completely transformed himself and was now able to travel without being recognized by anybody. He told me that during those months he had written his own story of the Kornilov affair, and he wanted us to publish certain chapters of this in our newspaper. This we agreed to do. Quieter and more simple in his manner, Kerensky impressed me as an intelligent and sincere person, one who might fill the role of a teacher or a preacher. No stranger would have believed that this was the man who, a few months ago, had been virtually the ruler of Russia. By the end of May a great many members of the Constitutional Assembly and the League for the Regeneration of Russia began to flee Moscow, and I decided that, for the time at least, it was imperative for me to work elsewhere. Spending two days in Petrograd, I left for Veliky Ustyug in Vologda province, North Russia. The time of speech-making and other preparation had passed. The time for action had begun. In Archangel the most horrible terror was going on. The Bolshevist commissary Kedrov executing people by hundreds and thousands. Victims were being shot, drowned, or murdered with unnameable mutilations. The peasants were being nationalized, that is, being robbed of most of their crops. Citizens, especially any who dared to protest against atrocities, were being searched, plundered, and arrested. Feeling the ground under their feet insecure, the Bolsheviki tried to strengthen their position by unrestrained terror. In the Vologda province the situation was somewhat better, although presage of the Red Terror was there. I had therefore to walk with caution and to conceal the real character of my mission, which was to organize Ustyug and Kotlas in connection with the planned overthrow of the Bolsheviki in Archangel. The district Ustyug Kotlas was important to the plan. Located between Vologda and Archangel, at the mouth of three rivers, Vichegda, Sukona, and Dvina, it was the center of concentration of enormous quantities of military supplies. Being a connecting link with anti-Bolshevist Siberia, this district had to play a very serious part in the re-establishment of the eastern frontier against the Germans, the overthrow of the Bolsheviki, and the re-establishment of the Constitutional Assembly. Liberating the north of Russia, Archangel, Ustyug, Vologda, and Yaroslavl on the one hand and the Volga district in central Russia on the other, it was planned to form a union with Siberia, and in this way to surround the capitals occupied by Bolshevist forces. The fact that Ustyug Kotlas was my native place and where I usually spent my summers, helped me greatly in carrying out my mission in safety. 
meeting many people in Vologda who were engaged in the same political work, my wife and I started for Ustiag in a nationalized steamer, full of peasants traveling from the starvation districts to Ustiag in hopes of finding their bread and flour. Emaciated and in rags, they loudly cursed the communists and all communia. Strolling on the deck that evening, I was suddenly addressed by one of these peasants. It seems to me I recognize you. He said. Recognition was not exactly what I desired on this trip, so I remained unresponsive. Don't you recall the meeting of representatives of the military regiments in Petrograd very shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution? Don't you remember how you warned us against the Bolsheviki? I was at that meeting and remember very well your words. Fools that we were. Blind and stupid sheep. We did not believe you then, but now we see that you were right. What we did not understand then we do now, but perhaps it is too late. Better late than never, I said. Surely. During these horrible months I have thought many times of your words. If there are any elections now, I will vote only for you. Because you understand. Please keep your recognition of me to yourself, I begged. And he promised. Next day the Bolshevist commissaries examined my papers and, not knowing me personally, passed me. Once more the mouse slipped through, and unmolested we landed at Ustiag. There we found a bitter struggle going on between the communists and the Ustiag Soviet, the municipality, and the district's self-government, Zemstvo. The Bolsheviki, unable to get a majority in any of these representative bodies, of course tried to disperse them, but they, supported by the population, continued to function. Sooner or later, however, the leaders and members would probably be arrested by force. My arrival became instantly known, not only to the national supporters but to the Bolsheviki, who spied on me night and day. I pretended to be there only on my annual vacation, attended no public meetings, delivered no speeches, and declined all invitations to participate in political activities. Tranquilly I pursued my studies, worked on my general theory of law, visited friends, walked in the woods, and bathed in the clear Sukona. Such innocent conduct weakened to some extent suspicions against me, misled the spies, and gained the confidence of many of the communists who in former times had been my students and friends. They did not wish to see me arrested and my neutral attitude was therefore a relief to them. Needless to say, my neutrality was purely fictitious. My walks, picnics, bathings, and visits were really meetings in which were fully discussed plans and organization for the Bolshevik overthrow in Ustiag and Kotlas, and within two weeks after my arrival our preparations were almost complete. By the middle of June, however, the situation became complicated. The central government, dissatisfied with the conciliatory policy of the local communists, sent a committee of Lettish, Jewish, and Russian communists to enforce the liquidation of capital and the dictatorship of the proletariat. These newcomers bore themselves like conquerors among a vanquished people. They tried to dislodge the representative bodies from their halls, to arrest leaders and all merchants, to expel capitalists from their homes, to close the markets, and to extort huge taxes from the bourgeoisie. The local communists did not dare protest against this wholesale communization, and on our part we decided that our only practical course was passive resistance. Before the overthrow in Archangel we could not disclose our plans, therefore we strove only to liberate the imprisoned people who had refused to pay the huge taxes. The peasants refused to close the markets, and the municipality, the district's self-government, and other representative bodies, every day dispersed, simply reconvened. One order after another was issued by the commissaries, but they did not have forces enough on hand to carry out their edicts. One day we went to a picnic near the old Troitsky monastery on the far side of the river. In the middle of the meeting a friend from Ustiag arrived with the news that a group of communists had broken into my house and into that of Zepilov, with orders for our arrest. Zepilov was a young poet and criminologist, the leader of the Social Democrats in Ustiag, and before the revolution he had saved from arrest and had assisted financially some of these very communists. He was a talented, generous, and most charming young man. After the revolution he, like many others, had shown himself a moderate and was now one of the strongest adversaries of the Bolsheviki. 
It was necessary now that we change our lodgings for new ones unknown to the communists, and that night we moved to a country house near the town. The Dvina has many islands and on one of these we took refuge. No boats being available, we undressed and, as best we could, holding our clothes clear of the water, we swam over to the first island. Still undressed, we crossed it. Too bad we have no photographers to take our pictures now. Said Zepilov. Representatives of the Russian people and a Russian editor on a revolutionary picnic. I never thought of the art of swimming as necessary to revolution, I admitted. You must interpolate in the Constitutional Assembly a law that every serious politician must take courses in athletics. Said Zepilov. The wind, the sand, the beauty of the evening put us in high good humor. Like children we laughed, joked, and enjoyed everything regardless of the dangers that threatened us. At last we swam the last sound, put on our damp clothes, and started to the country house. Next morning Zepilov, who had been so gay during our flight, came down to breakfast pale and downcast. It was a dream. He explained. A frightful dream. I thought I was standing in the church at my wedding. But standing before the altar with my bride I suddenly saw myself on the guillotine with Mr. Vitoshkin. Once a friend but now a rabid communist. As my executioner. I tried to kiss my bride and my mother, but he thrust my head under the knife crying out, the gods are thirsty. It is absurd of course to pay any attention to a nightmare, but I cannot help feeling depressed. Zepilov was engaged to be married, and this fact, together with the fact that he had been reading Anatole France's novel of the French Revolution, Les Dieux en Soif, seemed to account for his bad dream which we tried to laugh away. The loveliness of the day and the beauty of the meadows and woods in which we walked put him again into his usual good humor. From this time on we and the other, conspirators, began to live illegally continuing our work and looking forward to the success of our plans. At the end of June Nicholas Tchaikovsky left Vologda on the steamer Accredital. Previously I had received an unsigned telegram bidding me try to get passage on the same steamer and go with Tchaikovsky to Archangel, the telegram stating that permission to enter at Kotlas or Ust, Panega. This message disturbed me because it indicated that my vacation might be suspected to be less innocent than I had pretended. But as it represented orders, I altered my appearance slightly and joined Tchaikovsky on the steamer. He also was disguised, his long beard and hair having been removed. Our journey was an exceedingly dangerous undertaking. Inspection of papers we had been able to secure were simple statement that we were going to Panega to investigate rural communes. Our documents lacked official seals and signatures, but we hoped that their very informality would keep us from being suspected. Once betrayed into the hands of the degenerate Kedrov, it was easy to foresee what fate would await us. All our hopes rested on the permissions to enter Archangel which we were to get in Kotlas. For the rest we relied on the stupidity of the Bolshevist inspectors and on the word, commune, in our passports. Arrived at Kotlas, no permissions met us. But perhaps they would be at Ust, Panega. At all events we could only go on. As much as possible we kept our cabin. Many people on the steamer knew me, and if I went on deck there might be some who would ask awkward questions. So, on one beautiful evening we sat in our cabin watching the broad Dvina gleaming under the rays of the dying sun. Suddenly there was a loud knocking at the door and two commissaries entered demanding our papers. We gave them instantly, and the commissary scanning them, remarked. Why is there no official seal on these? What do you call this? I asked, pointing to the seal of the Society of Economic Research. I know no such Soviet institution. Said the man. Why, I exclaimed, this was the society which first began the struggle against the Tsar a century ago. Don't you know that Lenin himself as well as many other leaders have participated in its work? The certificates of this society are better than those of any other Soviet institution. Haven't you read the special privilege granted the society by Lenin? The commissary looked abashed. You can't expect us to read all decrees. He said. Certainly not, I agreed sympathetically. We are going to Panega to organize the commune among the peasants. 
Russian communism was not born yesterday you know. It existed many years ago, and that explains our present great success. By this time the poor commissary was completely confused. Excuse us comrades. He said at last. So many counter-revolutionaries are everywhere that we have to be very careful not to miss any of them. After two days we reached Ust, Penega, but here again we were disappointed for at the post office were no letters. There was nothing to do but send a telegram and wait in the village, which was about sixty miles from Archangel, for the answer. The village was so poor that it was almost impossible to get food, and besides, the peasants, suspecting us to be Bolshevist agents, refused to sell us anything. Go to the commissaries. They said. They have everything while we have nothing. Two commissaries, sailors from Kronstadt, soon called on us with a demand for our certificates. Again we lied successfully. A day passed, no telegram, and we began to ask ourselves what dreadful thing had happened. On the second day the expected license came, but only for Tchaikovsky. We agreed that he should go on and immediately on his arrival at Archangel communicate with me. My situation was very bad. Before the message from Tchaikovsky could reach me I should have been in the village at least three days. I, who was supposed to be an agent going to Penega for the study of rural communes, was staying in a tiny hamlet while steamers passed daily. I could not long escape suspicion, and besides I was half-starved. Nevertheless, I must justify my position in the eyes of the commissaries, so I took paper and pencil and began a house-to-house -house visitation, questioning the peasants about the organization of their rural community, the forms of peasant self-government, the division and redistribution of lands, etc. With the sailor commissaries I was quite friendly. They invited me to their house where a good dinner, tea, and even vodka was offered me. Plenty of food and alcohol in the midst of a hungry population, two mistresses to each man, besides violation among village girls, such was the way of life of these protectors of universal equality and brotherhood. Listening to their brutal admissions, yet I had to play my role to the end. The weather was beautiful, and I spent my time in investigation, in walking and bathing, and in visiting an old church of the 16th century. Once, walking along the river I came on the body which had drifted ashore. He had been shot before being thrown into the water, but whether he was the victim of a brawl or of the revolutionary bloodlust I could not tell. On the third day the expected message came. Cargo is retarded. Continue the study of rural communes. The telegram read. This meant. The arrival of English troops has been delayed. Return to Ustiag Kotlas. I telegraphed to Ustiag, how about the prices on furs? Receiving the answer. The same as before. By the next steamer I returned to Ustiag, where we continued our plans for the overthrow of the Bolsheviki as soon as the revolution in Archangel succeeded.